Now in the last class, we introduced the lambda calculus, a universal mechanism for computation that emerged in the early 20th century out of a few different kinds of ideas surrounding how we might structure and organize computation. Now we wanna be able to understand the mathematical foundations of the lambda calculus because we wanna understand its effects on implementation decisions for programming languages, and particularly how we can use it to implement higher order functions in functional programming languages. So in the last class, we looked at beta reduction. And beta reduction is the main rule that allows us to say, if I've got something where I have an application of a term with a lambda, which is kind of a hole that I can plug with some argument x, then I can take that body of that function, e sub zero, and I can substitute x with the actual argument and perform what's called this beta reduction. And so in the last lecture, it was informal because we didn't define precisely what this substitution operator meant. And I mentioned that there were some trickinesses sort of underpinning it. So we're gonna look at those today and see how we can define capture avoiding substitution. Now I'd also like to point out that there's a long history of the lambda calculus. Frankly, I'm not really the person qualified to talk about that. However, there's a really nice lecture by Dana Scott. I'm gonna link that lecture up here on the uh, description. And if you watch minutes five to 30, that's the relevant part that sort of deals with the introduction of the Lambda calculus. And you can write me a brief blurb, just DM, DM me on Slack and I'm happy to give you two participation points for doing so. All right, so let me start out by saying, if we had a definition for this substitution function, subst right here, then we could easily define a function to perform beta reduction. All we'd have to do is we'd have to match on this term and we'd just be able to see, aha, well, beta reduction can only apply whenever I have something in the function position that explicitly has a lambda where I can plug some argument in for x for the body. All right, so today we're gonna look at how to define this subst function and we're gonna find out that variables are an extremely challenging part of how we formalize the lambda calculus. Now let me also say that I think as a student, it's very tempting to see a lot of the choices that we're going to make and some of the ramifications that are gonna come out as sort of core or sort of inherently mathematical. And while there are some strong mathematical overtones justifying the way we set up the system, I wanna just be honest and say that a lot of the complication that we're going to see arise is because of particular choices in the way that we formalize the lambda calculus. Even the really tiny decisions we're going to make, like for example, including variables, are going to have profound impacts on the way that we're going to state various things. And if you were to formalize the lambda calculus in an equivalent but slightly different way, you might come up with a whole bunch of different kinds of constraints that would at their core have the same fundamental meanings when it came to the theoretical underpinnings of all this stuff, which is recursive function theory. That's kind of the root of what people were trying to figure out when they were playing around with lambda calculus and related ideas. So as we go throughout this lecture, I'll try to comment on what things are kind of fundamental and what things are a consequence of the way that we've set things up. The traditional way that people define the semantics for the lambda calculus is via textual reduction. So when people were first envisioning and sitting around and thinking, what did the lambda calculus mean? One obvious way that you can give meaning to the lambda calculus is by saying that some term, like this source term right here, can take a beta reduction and reduce to some smaller or more sort of computed term, some smaller term that we've done some computation or beta reduction on. All right, so in this case, we've expanded this argument right here by performing beta reduction on the right-hand side over here. And then we can take another beta reduction and step to our sort of final answer in some sense. This is what a term we've called in normal form. Uh, we'll discuss this a little bit later in the slides, but something being in normal form basically means we can't make any more computational progress on it. Now, one really core thing about the lambda calculus that's different than computation in most programming languages is that unlike most programming languages, the lambda calculus reduction is kind of non-deterministic in some sense. So in general, a term may have multiple beta reductions that you could possibly apply. There may be multiple beta redexes at any one point. And in fact, in this term, there are multiple beta redexes. So you have this redex we just uh, reduced right here, but you also have this outer redex where you could reduce the entire term applying this function to this argument. And so we have two beta redexes in this term, the outer one in red, the uh, inner one in blue, 
And the uh, one in red, the outer one, kind of corresponds to this right-hand branch that we've taken over here. All right, so this is a, a key thing to keep in mind. In the lambda calculus, we're going to have these reductions that are going to say which terms can reduce to which other terms, but it's not going to be a deterministic relationship. And that's one core thing that sort of separates the lambda calculus from programming. In programming, we usually have our program give only one meaning. That's not always the case. Sometimes, for example, we're programming with a machine learning toolkit, we may have probabilities, but generally, we're gonna have one meaning, a sort of deterministic interpretation for our semantics, right? And so that's one key kind of distinction between most programming that I think of and programming in the lambda calculus, or talking about reductions in the lambda calculus. And as we go throughout defining the meaning for the lambda calculus, we're gonna to have to think, how can we tame this non-determinism to define what's called a reduction strategy, which is going to give us some determinism in the semantics and going to help us turn these rules into a real systematic derivation for what a language would compute out of them. All right. So the two big topics and challenges that we're going to have to think about in this lecture are going to be, first, how do we implement substitution? There are some real tricky challenges with substitution that we're going to see. And then also, how do we deal with this inherent non-determinism, the fact that terms often have multiple redexes that we could apply at any one point? All right, so substitution is conceptually something that seems very simple. You would think you can just erase variables and replace with whatever term you want to substitute. But one thing that I would really caution you to think about is that in the lambda calculus, substitution is fundamentally where computation happens. Functions are applied, and the only thing that really makes progress in terms of the actual computation that occurs, the only way in which sort of the computation evolves is because of this substitution that we're going to do. And so really we shouldn't see substitution as something that's just sort of academic or secondary. Substitution is really the core thing. When we're using a lambda calculus, we're defining what it means for the term to evolve. We're giving these textual reductions. They become the core part of the computation mechanism. And so it's really essential that we think very carefully about what substitution is. All right, so to understand some of the issues surrounding substitution, we're going to have to take a detour and talk about something named free variables. So the free variables of a lambda calculus term are just the variables that haven't been explicitly bound by a lambda quantifier. So you can think of a lambda term as a binder that says, give me a, or lambda is let me have a x in some term. And so the free variables of if we just have a lambda term that's just x is just x. So if I don't have a term that's bound by a variable, well then that term is free. All right, if I put a lambda x in front of something, well, then the free variables of that thing are whatever the free variables are of the body minus, this is a set minus operator, this lambda, uh, the variable that has been bound by the lambda. So you compute the free variables for E sub B and then you subtract the singleton set x because you're binding it. So it's got a binder, it can't be free anymore, has to be uh, sort of taken out now. All right, and so then the free variables in my application finally are just the union of the free variables of each of the components. There are no binders there yet. All right, so the free variables of the application x and y, both x and y are free. There's no binder for either x and y in this expression. What about this expression right here? So we've got lambda x, x, and then y. So this x right here has this binder right here, but then y is free. There's no lambda that's binding it. What about lambda x, x, and then x? Well, this x is bound by this binder right here, but this x right here is not, and so x is a free variable within this expression. And then let's look at this expression right here. So we've got a binder y right here, we've got a binder uh, x right here, z is not bound, x is bound right here, but then Right here, x is not bound within this scope. So we've got z and x are our free variables. All right? All right, so let's do a little bit more practice. What are the free variables for each of the following three lambda terms? So maybe you wanna pause this here and try to work these out for yourself. So lambda x, x, y, and then we've got lambda x, 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 lambda x, 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 and then we've got lambda x, z, y, and then x. All right. 
So for this first one, we're just going to have uh, y. This x is bound right here, but then y doesn't have any single binder. All right, so this first one's gonna be uh, y. The second one, um, well, x is bound, and then both of these instances are bound right here, so this has no free variables. It's just the empty set. And then for this expression right here, uh, well, z is free, and then y is free, and then, oh, x is also free, because even though this x is bound within this expression, it's not right here. All right, so this is z, y, x, this is empty set, and then this is y. All right, so it looks like we got it right. All right, and then also we say that a term is closed when it has no free variable. Sometimes we'll also call these terms combinators. So the term is, uh, sometimes we call these, sometimes we call these combinators, closed terms. So closed terms are uh, combinators of the lambda calculus. So for example, we can see lambda x, x, lambda y, y, no free variables there. Similarly in this expression right here, but we've got these two expressions right here. These are open terms. So the opposite of a closed term is a term that does have some free variables, some open terms right here. All right, so let's go and define the free variables of some expression. So we're going to say that an expression is one of three forms. It's a symbol x, and if it's a symbol x, then it's just going to be uh, the singleton set x. All right, what if it's a lambda of x and some e body? Well, then it's going to be set remove free vars of e body minus uh, the element x. Otherwise, if it's a e0 or an e, uh, and then applied to an e1, then it's going to be set union of e0 and e1. All right, so that's how we calculate the free variables. Oops, take that out here. And set union breaks because this should have been free vars of E0 and then free vars of E1. All right, so I'll fix that. And then I can do free vars of lambda x, x applied to Z. And that gives me back the set of Z. All right, looks like it works. The definition of free variables is going to be crucial in allowing us to define something named alpha equivalence. When we have lambda abstractions, it doesn't matter that the variables have any particular name. We can always rename a lambda x to be a lambda y as long as we rename that x to be a y inside of the body of the lambda. Now you can only do this when you wouldn't capture a variable. What I mean by that is that you can only substitute x for y within this body whenever y is not a member of the free variables of e. The reason is that lambda x y in this expression, if you capture y by changing this x to be a y and then changing all occurrences of x to y here, which in this case there would be none, you've changed the definition from something that now Maybe the user had intended to have y actually have some meaning within some other expression, but now you've captured it. You've taken what should have been a free variable and you've actually made it into an argument. So you wanna be careful to preserve the fact that if things are free, they need to remain free because the user might intend to use them later, right? They might be, for example, constants that the user doesn't want you to rename the user of the theory. And so, when we have variables, if we have variables in our lambda calculus, which not all lambda calculi do, although it's pretty weird to not use lambda calculi with variables, you can do it. But if you have variables in your lambda calculus, you naturally need to account for this thing called alpha equivalence. And alpha equivalence just states that terms are all unique up to the equivalence of applying this alpha rewriting transformation. Every term has infinitely many terms to which it is alpha equivalent because we can always just rewrite the variable to be whatever we want using this alpha rewriting rule, all right? 
And um, again, what breaks if it's not enforced? So as y is a member of the free variables, then we're going to capture something, all right? So this is a topic that's going to come up in a few more slides when we try to define substitution correctly. Now, it turns out we can actually define lambda calculi without variables. And at the very early turn of the century, people realized when they were formalizing these lambda calculi that defining substitution is actually a very tricky thing to do, totally precisely mathematically. And it can often be really nicely if you don't have to deal with uh, variables explicitly. And so there are a few different techniques to do it. One of them is what's called De Bruyne indices. And in the, these De Bruyne indices, or De Bruyne index type encodings, you have, um, instead of variables, you have numbers that refer to which binder they get bound to. So instead of having a lambda xx, you just have a lambda. There would never be an explicit x, but then this one here would refer to the fact that it's sort of one up. This two here would refer to this binder up here in the top, all right? And then you just define sort of building terms up in the right way to sort of shift these numbers around, which is kind of the more challenging thing you have to do there. But on balance, sometimes it's a nicer encoding to use. However, we're not gonna explore it in this class because uh, using substitution actually meshes really well with the notion of computation we're gonna want when we build interpreters later down the line. Now similarly, people tried to define combinatory logic that is based off of fully closed terms. So you can actually rewrite any lambda calculus term that uses lambdas with arguments into just a big set of terms that actually is composed out of just a few basic combinators that are fully closed. This is extremely surprising, but maybe not so surprising because we can always compile arbitrarily complex you know, programming languages just down to tiny instruction sets. And so this is essentially the same result for the lambda calculus, right? All right, so now let's talk about how we can implement what's called capture avoiding substitution. This substitution operator that's going to be useful when we actually try to implement the beta rule in the lambda calculus. So first let's discuss what the problem is with naive textual substitution. So I've got this expression up here and I want you to think very carefully about what this expression should do. So here I basically want to take this argument, this lambda uh, bb, and I want to essentially drop it on the ground. And I want to replace this uh, and just forget about it because I'm rebinding A using the second lambda inside of this first lambda right here. However, using naive textual substitution, I actually wouldn't do that. What I would do is I would take this body right here. I would replace instances of A with lambda BB and I would get this result out where instead of the identity function, which is the result that should pop out of this expression if I'm you know, sort of thoughtful about what should actually happen with respect to static scope, well instead I get this function out where I now have two lambdas, which is certainly not the result I want. This is giving me totally the wrong result. So this illustrates why if I just use naive textual substitution, I will get the wrong result in general. So instead, I'm going to define this thing called capture avoiding substitution. So let's talk about how we're gonna do it. So the first two cases are easy. When I just have a variable and I'm trying to replace that variable, if I have some variable x and I'm replacing x with e, well then I just return the result e because I'm trying to replace x, I found it, I just return e. If I have some y, which is not equal to x, and I'm trying to replace x with e, well then I just return y, because I hit a variable, but that variable was not equal to the variable that I was trying to replace. All right, and then for the application case, it turns out that's actually pretty easy as well, because all I have to do is I just have to replace within the two sub-expressions e0 and e1. More interesting cases are the lambda cases, because they're the things that actually redefine variables. So in the case where I have a lambda x e0 and I'm replacing x with e, I actually just leave this one alone. I actually stop my substitution. I don't traverse anywhere into e0. Now, why is that? Well, it's because a lambda x is a redefinition of x. So if I want to replace the variable x within a lambda, well, I really don't want to do that. I want to stop doing that because the lambda is sort of giving a new definition to x. So whatever definition that was given to x before that I was trying to accomplish using substitution really shouldn't be valid, so I don't want to do that. Now, what about when I'm trying to replace into some lambda y, where x is not equal to y, and I want to substitute inside of this body here? Well, I have to be careful. I have to make sure that this y 
is not an element of the set of free variables of E, which is the thing that I'm replacing for X inside of this body E0. Now the reason is because if Y is a free variable in E, then it will change to being bound within this lambda Y. All right, and that's because this lambda would then bind Y. So it should be free, but because I've stuck this lambda Y in front of it, now it's bound. So when this happens, beta reduction cannot occur, and I have to instead first perform an alpha conversion so I can get a new fresh name so I don't violate this sort of side condition. All right, so let's look at some examples of this. How could you use beta reduction uh, using capture avoiding substitution to beta reduce the following term right here? So we've got this lambda y and we've got this big lambda z and then lambda y. And then we want to see if we can replace within this expression. Um, well, it turns out that in this case, it's not too hard because there's no overlapping variables here. So we can just sort of perform beta reduction just as usual. All right, let's take another example. Let's say that we wanted to beta reduce this redux right here, where we've got this lambda z and then we're taking this lambda x y. So let's say I wanted to take this body right here and I wanted to replace the instances of z with this lambda x y. Could I do that? Well, it turns out that I can't. The reason that I can't is that it would require that I replace z with lambda x y, but y is free within this expression. And so if I did this, it would actually be captured. So what I have to do instead is I have to replace this lambda y with and perform an alpha conversion to a lambda w. And so I do this alpha conversion where I take this expression here. I could do alpha conversion, which means I take the y, I replace it with w, and then I replace all instances of y within the body with w, but there are no instances of y, and so I just leave it alone. But then I avoid the problem with the side condition that we got up here, where we said that doing capture avoiding substitution requires y not to be in the set of free variables of the thing that we're replacing. So we sidestep that now, and then we can just perform the beta reduction as we might expect and get the result out, which is lambda y, lambda w, lambda x, y. All right. Now, because the beta and alpha reductions are sort of inherently non-deterministic, we are going to ultimately rely upon something called a reduction strategy. We're going, going to go in depth on reduction strategies in the next lecture, but I'm just going to give the two most common reduction strategies that we're going to talk about right here. So the first is what's called normal order or call by name reduction. And in these reductions, what you do is you always perform the leftmost or the outermost application. So in this case, we've got this outermost application here where we can just take this lambda and apply it to this argument. And then we'll step down to this right-hand side where we take this body right here that we got from replacing with this argument. And so we've got lambda z, z, and then y. And then here we only have one potential read x. And so then we just step to y. On the other hand, we're using applicative order. And in applicative order, we always perform the innermost application. All right, so we're always going to try to evaluate values first. This corresponds to what's called call by value interpretation. We're going to have to define values in the next lectures when we talk about closures and how we actually implement this at the machine level. All right, but in the applicative order, we're going to perform the innermost application or work on the argument first. And so when we perform this innermost application, we get this thing where we've got a lambda xx and then a y over here, and then we eventually step to this y. Now it turns out that uh, we can always step to some common term. We'll also talk about that concept. That's called the Church-Rosser property of the lambda calculus. We'll talk more about these concepts of reduction strategies in the next few lectures. 
call by name or call by need is implemented in some lazy languages like, for example, Haskell. However, most programming languages, including Racket, NoCaml, StandardML, Java, C and C++, really most languages that exist are actually call by value or applicative order. And we'll study the ramifications of those dis uh, sort of distinctions over the next few lectures. All right, and last, I should mention that there's one more conversion in the Lambda calculus. Along with alpha renaming and beta reduction, there's also what's called eta reduction or expansion. And this pro captures a property akin to function extensionality in sort of normal mathematics. So eta reduction says that if I have lambda x, e zero x, I can eta reduce that to e zero. All right, so if I have something wrapped in a lambda and immediately apply that a lambda to e zero, I can just replace that with e zero. Other times, if I have an e zero, I can always replace that by wrapping it in some lambda x, e zero x. Now, I was really confused about the role of these eta reductions and expansions for a long time. It turns out that when we're just computing on a day-to-day -day basis, really we just use the beta rule. That's the main thing that really drives most computation. And sometimes the alpha rule, just in the sense that we kind of need it for defining capture avoiding substitution. But the eta rule is a little bit stranger. We don't generally use it to actually build interpreters. However, we do use it to justify equivalences in things like lambda theories. And we will use it to actually help manipulate and derive certain things like the Y combinator. So I'll discuss the implications of eta reduction and contraction as we kind of go throughout the course, but it is something that you need to be a little bit aware of, although you won't use it on a day-to-day -day basis quite as much as you'll use beta and alpha type reductions in the lambda calculus. So when unambiguous, people often talk about reduction in the lambda calculus as just the combination of these three different reductions. They talk about it as beta reduction, which is just applying functions, alpha renaming, which is the fact that every lambda term is equivalent to any other kinds of alpha equivalent terms where you've rewritten variables in lambdas, and then uh, eta expansion and uh, reduction. So the combination of all of those three, when we just write right arrow, is typically just lambda calculus reduction, could be any of those three, all right? But however, when I give exams and things like that, I will specify uh, and, and really focus in on which reductions precisely you need to work on. Now, another thing is that it's often helpful to think of applying some sequence of reductions some number of times until we reach some ultimate result. Now, in the lambda calculus, we call those results normal forms. A normal form is just some expression that has a property where we can't apply any further reduction on it in some way. So for example, we say that a term is in beta normal form when there are no unreduced lambdas in function position. So in other words, there's no possible beta reduction you could apply. You've taken all of the different possible beta redexes and explicated them by reducing them to some canonical form. And you can sort of group terms by whether they end up in the same equivalent beta normal form or different kinds of, for example, weak head normal form, as we'll talk about in the next few lectures. All right, so we've really covered a lot of material here. I just wanna recap some of the terms that you should try to keep forward and bring with you as we continue on into the next few lectures. This stuff will be really important in conceptualizing how we build out interpreters, and I'll try to explain precisely the ramifications of the theory on the practice in terms of how that actually affects the implementation of programming languages. Now let's just recap a few of the different things. We talked about, for example, free variables. That's really important and allows us to define, for example, capture avoiding substitution and alpha renaming. We also recapped beta reduction, this time formally using capture avoiding substitution to implement it. And we also talked about eta reduction and expansion. And then we also talked about a little brief insight into reduction strategies and applicative versus normal order. Applicative order is the call by value interpretation where you're always reducing the innermost redex. Normal order is the call by name interpretation where you're always reducing the leftmost redex. So next time we're gonna be talking about how we can take this material and continue to work on it to determinize the semantics to give us something that's a real interpreter uh, out of these sets of rules.